Hi, I'm Guy Powell, and welcome to the next episode of The Backstory on the Shroud of Turin. If you haven't already done so, please visit guypowell.com and sign up for more episodes. I am the author of the upcoming book, The Only Witness, a historical fiction tracing a possible history of the Shroud over the last two millennia. Today, we'll be speaking with Kelly Kearse. He's a blood and chemistry researcher, and we'll be talking about some of the things that he's found out concerning the blood on the shroud. So let me tell you a little bit more about Kelly and his credentials. So Kelly Kearse has an MS in biology from the Virginia Commonwealth University and a PhD in immunology at University of Kentucky. He's done postdoctoral work in biochemistry at John Hopkins, as well as postdoctoral work in immunology with the National Cancer Institute with the NIH. He's the principal investigator in immunology with experimental immunology branch for the NIH. He's investigator instructor for immunology and cell biology at ECU School of Medicine. And for the last 20 years, science instructor at Knoxville Catholic High School. In addition, he's published over 50 peer reviewed articles in immunology and biochemistry and cell biology. And even better than that, which I'm very jealous about, he has viewed the Shroud of Turin in real life in August 2015. Kelly, welcome. Great to have you today. Oh, thank you. Great, great to be here. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. And uh, so tell us a little bit about your backstory and how you got involved in the Shroud of Turin. So the first time I, um, first time I remember seeing images of the Shroud was in the 80s. I was in college. I was uh, working at a grocery store, was on a break and saw a magazine, I think it might have been National Geographic, and flipped through some of the images. And uh, I thought it looked really interesting, but um, I kind of just had a casual interest for the next uh, number of years. I read a few books about it, I watched a few TV programs, but in uh, about 2010, it was going on exhibition and I thought I might be able to uh, make the trip. Uh, so in preparation for that, I started reading more articles and particularly listened to a lot of podcasts on it. And I didn't make the trip, but that kind of got me uh, interested in it, especially the blood because of uh, my background and sort of the more uh, questions I would look into, those would raise more questions and so forth and so on. So that's kind of how it really uh, took off in around 2010. Yeah, it's interesting because uh, I remember in 1978, vaguely hearing something about the STERP, the Shroud of Turin Research Project mm -hmm. and the scientific studies they did. And I said, oh, that's kind of interesting. And I, right. I think at the time I'd never even heard of the Shroud. So uh, uh -huh. kind of running in parallel with what your, your background is there. Right. Right. And then of course, with the uh, carbon 14 dating, that just kind of threw, <laughs> threw water <laughs> on everything, that's for sure. So uh, tell us a little bit about uh, what you found in terms of uh, your thinking and research and understanding and what you've read on the blood that's on the Shroud of Turin. So one of the kind of one of the first things I get into was uh, what type of blood is it? So you will often read, you'll often hear uh, that human blood has been found on the Shroud, that it's uh, blood type AB, that the blood is from a male. So when I started looking into the original work on, let's just take the, the human species designation, take that first. I started looking into that. Um, so this work was done primarily by Heller and Adler of Sterb and uh, Bima Bologna. And they looked at two major blood proteins, albumin, which is what uh, Heller and Adler looked at. And then both uh, teams looked at immunoglobulin or antibody. And the most work was done on albumin and Heller and Adler concluded, and, and I'll ex, ex, explain uh, their findings in more detail in just a second, but they concluded that uh, really it was primate blood, which is as far as they wanted to take it uh, scientifically as a conclusion. It is just kind of morphed into, well, it's been shown to be human blood uh, over the years. Um, what they did is they took, uh, they made an antibody against uh, albumin, and they didn't actually make it, but a company would do this. So you would inject a rabbit with human albumin, and the rabbit's immune system is going to make an antibody against human albumin. And then they use that to look at bloodstain fibers on the shroud and non-bloodstain fibers on the shroud. Well, they saw reactivity 
with the bloodstained fibers from the shroud, but not the non-bloodstained fibers. So that's good. That's where you want the reactivity to be if blood is really there. But they also did some parallel studies, even really before doing the actual shroud uh, experiments, to look at something called cross-reactivity. So what cross-reactivity is in immunology is that you can make an antibody against protein from one species, but that antibody may in fact recognize the same protein in other species. Because other species also have blood, they also have albumin, and it's not uh, vastly different from human albumin. Otherwise, it wouldn't really be able to perform its function. So Heller and Adler, they were very well aware of cross-reactivity. So they took um, their antibody that had been made against human albumin. They reacted it with albumin from chimp and they saw a positive reaction. And that's really not unexpected. Uh, they also saw reactivity with baboon albumin. Again, not really unexpected. Uh, did not react with albumin from cow, uh, from horse or from pig. So because of the reactivity that they saw before they really even did any experiments with shroud samples, because of that reactivity with chimp and baboon, they knew they could, the strongest conclusion they could make is that it in fact is primate blood. Couldn't really say exclusively human. Well, in the 40 years since those studies were done, it's now known that other species that were, have never been examined in any of those studies, is now known that uh, species such as cat, mouse, rat, dog, and quite a few others, those anti-human antibodies will in fact react very well with albumin from those species. And in the last 40 years, a lot of genomic or DNA work has also been done. So if you look at the DNA sequences of those other species, it's quite similar to human. So it makes sense that you would see that type of cross-reactivity. Now this is all, this is in 40 years of hindsight. So Heller and Adler didn't really have access to that kind of information. And these aren't uh, my studies on that. And this is a lot of different investigators have looked at that with uh, even unrelated to the shroud, just with uh, albumin in general. So I think what we now know, the best way to define it is it's species unknown because the cross reactivity is much broader than was originally appreciated. And also just to point out, you know, although it's, uh, often heard that the blood on the shroud has been shown to be human. None of those studies have ever been uh, reported in a peer-reviewed scientific journal. The primate, even the primate work is just a one-liner at best, and it's always just a work in progress. So the data really there, it's not as uh, strong or thorough as I think, you know, a lot of times it's talked about uh, or even written about as far as the human designation goes. Yeah, interesting. So what uh, what you're saying though is that uh, this cross reactivity uh, could be it could be human, could be primate, could be cat, could be dog, uh, but it can't. But then there's a couple other ones which it can't be. I think you said it was yes, a cow. Correct. It can't be a cow and, and things like that. Correct. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Now uh, the other one of the other statements that you often read about is that it's uh, A B, uh, and I don't remember if it's positive or negative, but um, that it's it, A B. Yeah, A B. Right. And um, uh, so tell us about, tell us about that. Okay, so you have basically four uh, uh, blood groups. You have type A, type B, uh, type O, and type AB. Uh, a is the most, or excuse me, O is the most prevalent. It's around, uh, it's just under 50% or so. And then uh, second place is A, it's around uh, upper 40s or so, something like that. Then uh, B is in third place, and AB is it's the rarest of all. It's a, around three to five percent, although that's going to vary a little bit according to geographical region. Uh, so there's two ways you can type blood, and if you go to um, when you donate blood and that blood is transfused into someone, they will always perform these two types of tests. Uh, one of them is called forward typing, where they look for those A, B or both AB molecules on the surfaces of red blood cells. The O type uh, doesn't have those additional uh, structures present. So um, these A and B antigens are carbohydrates or sugars. So it just depends on which particular type of carbohydrate, what modification you have, whether you're A, B, uh, or if you don't have any, then you're O. So 
Forward typing, when you go to uh, give blood, a typical blood donation, and they do it on a card, that's usually what's done there, a type of forward typing. Um, there's a second type, it's called reverse typing. So there you look for uh, not what's on the red blood cells, but what actually is in the liquid portion of the blood, in particular antibodies to blood cell molecules. So people will always contain antibodies against the particular blood type that they lack. So for example, if you're type A, you will have antibodies against B. Hmm. If you're type B, you're going to have antibodies against A. If you're type O, you'll have antibodies against both A and B. And if you're type AB, since you have them both, you won't have antibodies against either one. Hmm. So with fresh blood, forward typing, reverse typing is pretty straightforward. And the reason both are done is just to make sure that that's truly that blood type because you don't want to put the wrong blood type into someone when you transfuse it. And they actually confirm and cross check one another because it's very easy to predict what the results will be from forward typing and reverse typing. When you have older blood, you can run into some issues. So with reverse typing, uh, there's no way to tell if it truly is AB or if in fact it were originally A or originally O or originally B, because these tests are functional tests, and which depends on a 3D confirmation, a 3D shape that is going to um, decrease over time. So usually reverse typing is never done in older samples, because it, particularly for AB, because it really can't tell you uh, anything. And, a lot of those results will often come up as AB, but what the type originally was, you don't really know unless you confirm it with DNA testing. So reverse typing, we can just kind of, especially for AB, just put that one off to the side because your conclusion is that it's gonna be inconclusive. The forward typing for fresh samples, no problem. For older samples, because these um, antibodies are carbohydrate or sugars in nature, a lot of different organisms express them, such as bacteria and fungi. So you have any type of contamination, uh, the samples are gonna type as AB uh, just because those other organisms might be present. So if you look at older samples, it is not uncommon at all to have a relatively high proportion of them being AB. Again, you really don't know unless you look at the DNA level, which circumvents all of those issues to confirm it. So the blood type being AB, not a surprise at all that that's what the result would be because it's an older sample. It could be AB, but again, I think that's something that's inconclusive. You would need something to help corroborate that. And those studies also, even though it's a widely reported that the blood is type AB, uh, that has never been published in a peer reviewed journal. Uh, yeah, that was uh, that was fascinating when I was uh, reading up on some of the uh, papers and, and videos that you've done that 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 was potentially the case. Does that, though, however, rule out that it's definitely not O, so it, it could be A, A, B or, you know, not really. I think you still would have the. I think you still would have the same problem. Mm. If you if you look at the DNA level, what the DNA level does, which may or may not be possible in an older blood stain, but what the DNA level does, it looks at the enzyme that actually adds those particular modifications. Mm. So it mm. completely circumvents any kind of contamination or uh, decrease of function over time. And if you do both together, that's really the best thing because they can really corroborate and really support the result. Yeah. 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 Now you didn't talk about like, you know, AB positive or AB sure. negative. Okay. Is that so what the, what the positive or negative refers to is something called the RH antigen or RH factor uh, comes from rhesus monkeys where it was first discovered. It was back in the 1940s. Uh, you'll see on the internet that, well, the shroud is AB positive, or you can also see it's AB negative. But uh, I've uh, personally communicated with some of the people that have uh, done some of the work on that. And it was never, uh, RH has never been tested mm -hmm. on shroud samples. So I think when, when someone might say it's AB positive, what they really mean is, well, it's positive for AB. Mm. But usually in blood designation, if you put the positive after it, that refers to that RH designation. Yeah, yeah. So uh, so basically, then some, it, it sounds like then you have, uh, we don't even know if it's primate uh, blood, 
uh, but we and we've ruled out a couple of types of animals, but have also then ruled in a whole bunch of others that I think we weren't expecting. Yes, I, I would. Yes, yes, sir. And I think, I think if it were tested again, along with trying to, and there are antibodies now that will specifically recognize human and don't show that cross reactivity. But I think you could also test for certain other species just to definitively mm. show that you had no reaction. And if you you can set it up where you can get multiple answers out of one sample, get a lot of bang for the buck, you know, to try to do it on both both sides of the coin. But so I think scientifically that would, you know, I think if, if, if it's going to be said, well, we know that the blood is human and it's been shown to be human. There needs to be scientific evidence that backs that up. And it's a it's a real fundamental question. Real yeah. Basic question. yeah. 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 So can you tell if it's male or female? Male or female. So there, what you're going to do is you're going to move from the immunology over to the DNA side of things. Mm. So you're going to look for the presence of an X chromosome uh, and or uh, a Y chromosome present there. So the data that's been reported that, again, no peer reviewed uh, things, but in the book, The DNA of God by Garza Valdez in the 1990s, he reported that he got a positive signal for the X and Y chromosome on some bloodstained fibers. So he concluded uh, that the blood is from a male. The problem with that is uh, skin cells also contain uh, the genes for the X and Y chromosome. They also contain the gene for hemoglobin, which is the third one that he looked at in support that it really is blood, but skin cells also contain those genes. Um, so, an average person in one day sheds about 400,000 skin cells, some of which contain DNA, which can easily be transferred just by touch. And given the number of people that have handled this route throughout the years, and DNA can even become airborne, so you should wear a mask uh, around it. Hard to say where the DNA comes from. I mean, it, I think in no way indicates that the blood is uh, truly from a male. I mean, you can, mm. all you can really conclude from that is, well, human DNA has been found on this route, really no surprise because it's known mm. a lot of people. Right. It. And some people have even reported female DNA uh, present on this route. And if you look at unique DNA sequences, uh, again, no peer reviewed stuff, but just kind of what's been reported, uh, there's at least six different unique profiles of individuals that have been found. So I, I think that is another uh, undetermined. Yeah. Yeah, well, it's interesting too, and uh, so you basically, <laughs> within a handful of minutes, you've blown a blown away all the arguments <laughs> that it was AB <laughs> and that it was male. <laughs> I, I, I think that honestly, scientifically, that that's where it sits. Yeah, yeah, and that and that makes sense. And I and I, I believe too, you know, to your point, then as as the science progresses and then the tests get much more specific. One thing I like about well, one thing I don't like about science is that quite often you can only tell that it, that it's not something you can't prove right. that it is something it you right. can only prove right. that it's not and i think you know for the non scientist that's something that it kind of is very frustrating so you can sure. prove you know you found ab uh, blood or what appears to be ab blood on there but that could be the the decayed remnants of any of the other blood types potentially. And then to your point as well, you know, and I've got this picture of my shoulder here, which was one of the extensions, and you can see six of the bishops holding the edge holding. of the shroud. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and, you know, you think about that and you think about the poor, poor Claire's sisters having done their repairs and everybody sure. else having touched it and kissed it and laid other copies of the shroud on top of it, that the, the contamination has got to be, uh, you know, immense especially if it is 2000 years old. So if, if it is authentic, then uh, the, the contamination across all of, all of that time and all of those touches and, and even to your point about it potentially having, you know, fungi or some other, sure. you know, uh, organisms yeah. on it that, uh, that that would really make it difficult. So do you, th do you think it's possible though to, um, uh, with 2000 year old blood to actually get a, a reasonably good DNA test of the blood that seems to be coming that you know seems to have so, been on the shroud originally yeah that's a i would say that's a maybe because you're always gonna gonna be faced with the potential problem of degradation uh but i think you really don't i think you don't know until you look and, mm. and modern technology you can do a lot with just a tiny bit 
of uh, DNA. And there's two options. There's nuclear DNA and mitochondrial DNA, which is much more, uh, there's many more copies of mitochondrial DNA that would be present. And just to point one quick thing out about the DNA studies that were, were previously done. So a lot of times you'll hear, well, an X, parts of the X and Y chromosome were found, but everything else was degraded. So that couldn't be looked at. The, the way the studies were done is through a technique called polymerase chain reaction or PCR. It selectively amplifies the genes that you're interested in. Mm -hmm. So those XY and the uh, haptoglobin, a beta globin subunit were intentionally chosen. And then probes were used that would amplify those three genes. And they won't amplify anything else because the probes are specific. So the PCR technique, it's like a Xerox machine that just makes copies and copies and copies and copies, but only of that particular gene that you're interested in. You could have looked for another gene and amplified that up. It doesn't mean that it's necessarily not there. It's, it was selectively done. So it's not like those were the only three genes that had somehow survived, and that's why they found X and Y chromosome. It's they were selectively chosen to be mm. amplified, but in degradation, I think that's certainly something that uh, that could be an issue. But yeah. I think you you know you don't really know. I think until you look at it, and maybe uh, the best place to sample is actually on the reverse side of the cloth, which has been mm. handled much less frequently, and also below the surface as the blood stains soak all the way through. Go into kind of the interior and take the sample out there, and I think you'd have to do it for several blood stains just to kind of compare. The results and see how much they would create. So that's a that's a possible, but again, the uh, degradation is something that could uh, preclude that. But a lot of um, you don't always need the full link gene to get yeah. to get the answer. Just like uh, sometimes you can hear two or three notes of a song and you can name what the song is right away, or you can see two or three lines from a novel or movie script and you can tell right away what that particular knowledge. You can do the same thing with the gene. Mm. So um, with it being potentially 2000 years old, are there actually whole blood cells that have would have survived or, or I, would that not be the case? I don't believe so. I think those would have dried out long, you know, long time ago, way before 2000 years, even a, a few years. Um, mm. You can see a lot of times what um, appear to be red blood cells because of their concave shape. But... <laughs> I've heard both sides of this. Uh, some people say that what happens when you actually go to examine these during the kind of fixing procedure, they will reseal, sort of like patching a tire. They'll kind of reseal. The membranes will stick together if there's enough of it there. And then they'll kind of go back to what the uh, shape is, as opposed mm. to they could be chewed up by bacteria mm. uh, pretty bad, um, and you might not be able to tell. And I think you, you have to really be careful in those older samples of just seeing something that has a type of spherical shape and saying, you know, that's a red blood cell right there. I think you have to go at it with the red, red blood cell marker probe to try to look at it using electron microscopy or something like that. Something that was specifically tagged with yeah. blood cell. So it's not only kind of roundish, but hey, it also lights up with that specific tag. Yeah, interesting. So even then taking the samples to do, let's say to do a modern DNA test, to get a, a, a pure sample of, let's say, blood that's on there. Because I could imagine that there's probably very little blood contamination. I could see that there's, you know, skin cell contamination, but, you know, there would probably be significantly less blood cell contamination. And I guess if you took samples of blood cells from the different, you know, areas where there, well, then there's so many different areas where there's blood, you know, maybe that would be a way to be a little bit more confident that you've got a, a reasonably good sample. And at least reduce the probability that you have con uh, sure. know, contamination. Yeah. Sure, sure. Yeah, I'd say you'd go for, you know, like three or a minimum yeah. of three or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, so of course, then that means the uh, the church has to uh, allow some scientists in there to to start doing some of these tests. Right. And, you know, everybody I talk to, it, uh, it's it's always the same thing as, uh, you know, come on, let us, at, let us at it. We need, you right. know, let us have another chance. And, right. and unfortunately, um uh, Unfortunately, I think the carbon-14 uh, testing kind of put a lot of a big damper on that and, mm -hmm. and uh, slowed things down. I, I kind of, uh, you know, and, and that, that is really, I think, a, a big shame. So now, um, now you might mentioned uh, Baima Baloney. Is, uh, is there anything else that he's done that we didn't talk about yet that might be interesting or? 
So his major major thing would be the he did the human counterpart with um, immunoglobulin. So there were and Helen Adler did albumin and immunoglobulin. By McGloney did uh, immunoglobulin. He never really mentioned cross reactivity whatsoever. But with immunoglobulin, cross reactivities it would be even more of a concern from an immunology standpoint, even more of a concern for cross reactivity than with albumin. So I think all the same caveats with albumin, same, same things apply there. And he was the major one that he's really the only one that's done the, the uh, AB blood typing. Garza mm -hmm. Valdez did uh, kind of a single experiment with uh, B, looking at B, but again, it was just uh, kind of part of an addendum in the, in the book, nothing really that, uh, that strong. So that the AB typing for Bimaglone, he's the, the main one. I mean, he's also done some stuff with the, presence of aloe and myrrh using immunofluorescence and things like that. But uh, blood-wise, the human and AB, those would be his two major things. Mm. Now, um, you mentioned the aloe and myrrh. Where, uh, has there been any aloe and myrrh found on the cloth? So you get kind of two sides of that there also. So uh, Rogers and those in the STIRP team, team using chemical methods, very sensitive. Uh, in HPLC, they did not find any evidence for it, which uh, those are some pretty unique structures. So you think part of it would be there. Bima Bologna using immunofluorescence saw it light up positive with antibodies against aloe myrrh. But again, not a, not a peer reviewed paper. And honestly, I think looking at the paper, there are quite a few extra controls that you would like to see in there mm. for antibody specificity. And I think Natowski, if I'm not mistaken, I think she might have done some based on kind of morphological characteristics, looking at some of the slides where this looks like it could be uh, particles, but I don't think there's really been anything definitive. I think the more, well, I, let me take that back. I think the more definitive side of it with the STIRP team on that, they did not find any chemical. Yeah. Any chemical. Yeah, yeah, because I was um, uh, for my uh, Sunday school. I was doing some research on whether they, whether the women had time to apply the, mm -hmm. you know, the the seventy five pounds of uh, of nard that was brought or claimed to have been brought. And uh, now, is that a is that are those dust or are those oil or are they kind of greasy? You what know, are, I've also heard that I've kind of heard that both ways. Maybe a combination. I think some of it would be in bags, maybe that were placed around the body, but also maybe some in oil for kind of anointing or cleaning mm. or something like that. I'm not, I'm not entirely sure, but I've sort of heard kind of both, both sides of that also. Because it, it would seem like, and I don't know, we maybe we're getting off, but it would seem like um, on the application of those, if it was like an oil or a, a greasy kind of thing, that would then smear a lot of the you the blood stains that are on there so if yeah. it was a dust then you know okay you could you could sprinkle that on and that would be right. all right and then it would transfer to the cloth in some fashion probably be in the uh you know if the sweat dried or if the blood dried you know it'd be in you know as a component of that as they were then absorbed into the cloth so uh that might be you know one way they got there personally it even though they uh, it, you know, if you read the, the four gospels on, on what happened, then it, it's possible that they didn't get to apply the, the aloes and myrrhs. They were, that's why they were coming back that Sunday morning to apply them. So, right. Right. Yeah. Um, so then, uh, tell us a little bit about, uh, Ray Rogers. Now he did some, uh, something with the soapweed plant. What was that all about? Sure. So he, um, that got into the question, why is the blood, uh, the redness of the blood, it's redder than you think it would be for 2000 or even several hundred uh, years old. So he, his idea was that um, based on some writings uh, that uh, ancient linen was processed with a plant called uh, soapweed or a bouncing betty is kind of the nickname for it. And the extract from that is called saponin, saponin extract. So that believes it was treated with that just to help make it more soft or more supple so that an ancient linen that was just part of the processing uh, step. It's known that a uh, saponin is hemolytic, so it will uh, lice or break open red blood cells. So his idea was the shroud contains saponin on it. And you, once you put blood on that, then it breaks the red blood cells open. Mm. And that's what causes the blood to stay red. And he said that he could take, he'd taken linen, treated it with saponin, and if you put blood on regular linen, it turns brown uh, relatively quickly. 
matter of days, weeks. If you put it onto saponin treated cloth, he said the blood stayed red for over 30 years, but no pictures or anything was ever provided of this. So that was his theory, the saponin theory. So um, I was interested in this, interested in the blood color. So I uh, made saponin extract from plants. I bought extract that had already been made. I looked at about 10 or so different types. Um, I'm, I can verify that the saponin is hemolytic. I tested that uh, in a separate assay. And uh, I didn't find any evidence at all that the blood color, uh, that saponin affected the blood color. Until I got to, it was the fourth saponin I used. So I just kind of remember them. I call it saponin four. Uh, and if you look in the, the uh, paper on this, it'll, one of the figures, it has SAP4 labeled. When I treated with SAP4, regular blood a day later, 24 hours later, turned brownish. The SAP4 blood stayed bright red. So I looked at what was particular about this extract and it contained glycerol in it. So when I took glycerol at approximately the same concentration with no saponin at all, I treated the filter paper or linen with that, um, I saw that the blood stayed red. So it really didn't have anything to do with saponin at all. It was just a glycerin or glycerol effect. Mm. And I could get it to stay red for a little bit over a week or so, you know, a couple of weeks. And then when you get up to the month, first month, two months, there it starts to go brown just like the other. So it had kind of a, um, I guess you call it a short-term effect, but it's longer than what it, you know, mm. normally would be uh, for a week or a couple of weeks, uh, but really didn't have anything to do with saponin at all. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. So, um, was the, was the linen cloth, was it dyed? I'm uh, not dyed. Was it, um, bleached to be white? Right. So, so I had, um, I had linen specifically made natural linen woven, uh, that hadn't been treated with anything at all that I used, uh, that I used in the experience. Mm -hmm. So Rogers, mm -hmm. some of his, it had, I think accidentally gotten the iron, um, Kate Edgerton, Edgerton, I believe, if I, if I recall that correctly, ironed it. So he, I think, went back and bleached part of it or vice versa. And I uh, actually followed those steps in his protocol because uh, I don't think he really intended for that to be done, but it happened to the linen sample he had. So I actually did experiments where I had followed the bleach and ironing and it, it didn't make any difference. Mm. Well, because one thing, um, as I was doing uh, research for my book, one of the, the big things that was used for a bleaching was urine, uh, as mm -hmm. opposed to, you know, today, modern bleach would be something different. And, yeah. um, you know, and, and would, would urine have a different effect than what you're talking about by any chance? Oh, uh, that might. That's a, that's certainly one I, I haven't done. That's, that's interesting. Yeah, that's yeah. interesting. Yeah. Huh. And <laughs> just as an aside, and I'm sorry to do this, but uh uh, they even used urine for uh, for a toothpaste. No kidding. And so that would be a way to you know to clean your teeth oh, and I guess the kill teeth. the germs. Yeah. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. yeah. So urine was a was a was used all over the place for yeah. different things, and one of them was to uh, was to bleach the 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 raw material. Huh. Huh. So uh, you know you never know. So interesting um, idea. I don't I don't. Yeah, it's very interesting. Yeah. I don't think I've I've heard that one. Uh, you know, put in there. Yeah. Well, do you think um, the uh, the cloth in the Gospels, and I think it's in John, it says a clean white cloth. Uh, do you think it was really a clean natural white cloth or a clean, you know, bleached cloth? Is uh, I I don't really. I honestly don't know. I, I personally, I guess I I don't, I don't know because the cloth no. now you know looks like it's faded to that that kind of a right. tan brown right. red whatever you, color you want to call it right. and i was always right. wondering whether that what that color was and and then of course you have the uh, the 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 reweave theorists and certainly there's a there's a lot of interesting evidence uh, i guess time will tell whether it's you know positive or negative that mm -hmm. where they took the carbon 14 dating from had uh, some matter uh, i think it's matter dye is the name of it right. and it had right. some gum as well on that area and potentially even cotton as ray ray rogers may have found some cotton in that that area as well and um uh you know so it would be 
what what I was kind of interested in is it would seem like those would fade in color at a different rate than the the rest of the shroud. And so right. then that would be, you know, another thing that would stand out at some point if there was a repair that was done. There. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, uh, okay, so um, then any thoughts on to what actually caused the image? We know it's not paint, it's not a dye, it's not a whatever it is we, what, uh, you know, as a chemist and, and you know, in your background and what you've read, what, what's kind of your, what are some of the things you found or what, is, what are some of the theories so you think I, um, you would go after? So I, uh, Ray Rogers also had this idea of the Maillard reaction, uh, which is kind of a natural type of uh, image formation process. Um, I think it's almost easier to kind of say about the shroud, like what, what didn't cause the image than what, what may have caused the image. But uh, so there's some ideas that radiation might have uh, caused the image, some type of energetic transfer that led to oxidation, dehydration of the uh, cellulose. I think that's certainly a possibility. Uh, Ray Rogers' idea was the Maillard reaction may have caused it, which for the Maillard reaction, you need just basically two things. You need sugar, which he believes would have come from the saponin coating of the cloth. So that's where the sugar side of it would have come. And then you need a amine group, uh, which you can find in proteins or various, what he believed mostly was responsible for it was volatile gases, such as ammonia and cadaverine, things like that, that would have come out of the body. Mm. So that was his main thing that, well, you had the sugar, the cloth provided the sugar part and you had gases that diffused out of the body. The, so you can, take, um, you can take cloth or filter paper, you can coat it with a saponin or sugar, you can expose it to those volatile means and you will get a yellow color, uh, just like, I mean, Ray Rogers showed this also with linen. You'll get a yellow color. He said when he looked at the fibers under the microscope, they had the same properties as the shroud fibers. So you get the color, but what you don't get with just the gases is you don't really get the detail. Mm. So he took a, a hand made out of paper mache, coated it with ammonia, then put a saponin treated cloth over it, and then came back a little bit later and looked at it. And you can see some kind of fogginess image stuff on the cloth, but I think it's really, really difficult to see any detail with like a hand or, or things like that. So I think what may have been overlooked in the Maillard idea, and I don't know if the Maillard idea is the answer, but I think it's certainly an interesting, an interesting uh, idea, is skin cells also, skin cells contain proteins. Proteins are made of amino acids. Uh, they have these amine groups on them. Uh, several amino acids have extra amine groups to side change. So when a person, when a person gets a spray tan, for example, when they spray the skin, what they're spraying on is just a sugar solution. So that sugar solution causes a Maillard reaction on the skin, and that's what leads to that brown or tanning color. And depending on how much you add or which particular uh, types of sugar, you can get a yellow color, you can get uh, mm. brownish, you can get even a red color, oranges color. Um, so given the fact that we know skin cells are shed and you really don't even need the skin cells themselves to come off, you just need some degradation products to come off, uh, those could react with the contact portions of the cloud, the uh, shroud, not cloud, shroud, together with the diffusing. And I think those together could give you the detail that you see with the image. Mm. And I don't know if just looking at the image, you're going to see a composite of everything, whether it came from diffusion or whether it came for contact. It's, it's like that, that fair game where you go and there's a bunch of balloons and you throw darts to break the balloons. So maybe you break 10 of them with your left hand, which would be the gases, and maybe you break 25 of them uh, with your right hand, which would be the skin component. When you look at that, you just see all the busted balloons. You don't really know which ones were mm. from the left side or the right hand side. So I think it's a composite uh, of those two. And uh, you can take um, like a young mouse that is just a few days old, which has no hair yet, skin. You can put that onto uh, saponin treated filter paper, come back a little bit later, and you will see an image 
that certainly has some detail on it. So that was in the uh, talk I gave at our cathedral here. I presented some, mm. some recent work there. The skin is very wrinkly on those guys because they're so young. And if you look, especially in the black and white version, you can start to see some of the, the wrinkle mm. details. Um, so I think that's, I think that's certainly a possibility. Mm. Um, I don't, and I don't, I think some of the theories that are put forward involving energy and things like that, I, I don't think that and the Mailer reaction are necessarily mutually exclusive. You can have some combination that would do mm. Now It's often said about the Mailer reaction. Well, it's temperature dependent, which is totally true, but, it doesn't have to be at a high temperature to occur. You can do a Maillard reaction uh, at four degrees. And I've done that. You can do it. You can have, you can see the color at four degrees. You can see it within a day or so. And if you, hmm. if you, if you, that's just at four degrees, leaving it at four degrees. Now, if you take it out from four degrees to room temperature, that's going to accelerate the uh, coloration. It's going to speed a little bit up. And as you go with time, it's going to even get um, a little bit darker. So it's not mm -hmm. that you have to have a really high uh, level. Like for some Maillard reaction, cooking toast, things like this, you do. But for a lot of them, using those specific amino acids, and it depends on which ones you use and which sugars you use, but you can see it happen at uh, even, you know, relatively, relatively low temperatures. Again, four degrees, room temperature, it'll certainly take off if you heat it up you can see it faster but so if you if you have one at a higher temperature you'll see the coloration almost immediately if you do it at room temperature you may see a faint thing but by the next day mm. i can tell you though they've caught up to each other you really can't tell which one mm. you know which which one is from where so that i think yeah. that's one possibility i'm not really um i'm not totally wedded to it i'm not like a huge proponent of it but i think that the skin side of that was just overlooked and so i wrote the paper because i felt like you know something really needs to to be said about this as a possibility and honestly i got into all of that side of it because i wanted to do an experiment that addressed the blood first uh image second uh, type idea and i needed to make image fibers in order to do that so that's you know uh, don't have lasers or anything uh here so for the maillard reaction as rogers described the characteristics of the fibers were just like the shroud fibers that seemed a good avenue for me to pursue and i was kind of interested just from the carbohydrate side of it to be honest yeah but, but if I, you, uh, I certainly think i think that's one possibility but i think there could be other possibilities as well yeah yeah interesting the um but on with the with a chemical reaction like the maillard uh that would though tend to go in all directions uh, it seems you know, like I, I think most again, of the, I think, think it's all vertical. Uh, is well, the, I think the contact, I think the contact part would be the majority of it. Mm. And that would, I think that's going to appear more as a vertical kind of thing. I think you could still have some gas diffusion, mm. but I think that's going to, that can give you the resolution that you see. And, uh, but then wouldn't that also leave some kind of a trace chemical on there that could be now seen? You know, and, well, so... So you have the saponin, which, you know, Rogers proposed, and then you have the uh, amine group. It doesn't have to be a full protein, just has to be uh, a degradation product. And mm. a lot of that uh, extra protein, if there, probably would have been chewed up by bacteria long ago. And once it becomes a Maillard product, then, you know, you're really not looking for the same thing. And the characterization of the image doesn't rule out uh, a Maillard product. Yeah. So, you know, I think more, more work needs to be done on exactly the image. What exactly is that image composed of? Is it really just a cellulose or is there room also for a Maillard product? And Maillard yeah. products there are very, very wide. So I've communicated with a lot of Maillard experts. That's all they do is the Maillard. And, well, what are some, you know, tests to do to just kind of nail down? Man, it's like, boom, it just all depends. Hmm. It's just very, very hmm. wide open. Interesting. So um, getting close to the end there here sure. now, and um, what do you, do you think the shroud will ever be proven to be authentic or will there like be a 99% or a 99.9 .9 or something like that? Or I, Yeah, I think with science, I don't think you're ever going to prove it. I don't think science is ever going to give you even like a 99.9%. .9%. I think science could disprove it with mm. one or two experiments, but prove 
in in science prove is just a really really it's really tough tough word you know you can kind of start to rule a lot of things out and uh even if you can't explain it i think there's still has to be some room there to try to you know to try to still be objective about it yeah there's well, gonna, and that's what i yeah i think there's always going to come a place with it where science is going to end and faith is going to have to come in yeah. the field again. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I, and I, I think as science kind of progresses, and, uh, you know, the, the amount of faith, so to speak, that you need is getting less and less, and not that you need to have faith that way. It's not, it's right. not faith in Christ, it's faith that it's, it's either it or not. So, right, right. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. Because I liked, I, what I liked about the stirp, and, um, you know, and I haven't, I, I've read through different pieces of it. And, you know, they rule, they just like a typical scientist, they, you know, they ruled out this, they ruled out this, they ruled out this. And it was kind of fascinating to see, you know, all the things that it wasn't. And, uh, right, and that I right. think was, was really, was really pretty powerful and that they couldn't figure out where the image came from, you know, what yeah. caused that image. They, you know, yeah. it wasn't pain. It wasn't die. It wasn't this, it wasn't that. So, right. Right. Yeah. So what do you think the next big thing is then for the shroud? Oh, so for me personally, I would like to see the I would like to see the blood, uh, the blood characterized further. Mm. Um, just to, you know, if you want to say that it's human blood or whatever, just have the evidence to back it up. And it's it's a it's not a difficult test. It's pretty pretty straightforward. I would like to see that um, the dating, the reweave dating, uh, all of that. I would like to see that uh, revisited. Also, further image characterization. Mm. I think that would that would all be helpful. Just that even you know um, some of these tests, like the blood test, those tend to be non-destructive or are destructive. So once you give the sample, you can't yeah. really get it back. Yeah. But again, I think if you went to the reverse side, you could do it without really any. Uh, I mean, Bima Bologna used forceps to remove threads, and you really can't tell can't mm. tell where that happened. That was from the side that's visible. But uh, I think even a lot of some high definition uh scans to be released of the reverse side of the cloth and also some ultraviolet photography of the reverse side of the cloth uh some uh elemental scans um with technology that's available now all of that non-destructive would be extremely helpful yeah you know, it's, yeah yeah well, it's I'm hoping... tough kind of just going over the same data that yeah, no, I know. You know is, is yeah. there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there are a couple of samples that that were taken, and there's also a request to so they I think it was 2002, they cleaned it, which was kind right. of a that was not a good thing. But anyway, yeah. they cleaned it and they clipped off some of the the burnt marks and threads from around the like the uh, the chambery fire and stuff like that and and if those then could be used uh to test that would be at least uh you know some way that it's kind of already you know destroyed so you could potentially right. do some destructive tests on those right 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 yeah yeah well fascinating uh kelly uh thank you uh, so much uh, very fascinating and and uh, I will admit, I was uh, when I when I saw your name and read some of your papers, and I said, "Oh no, he it's not AB positive I, or AB blood." I'm, uh, you know, all of a sudden that one just got knocked out. I was really <laughs> very surprised about that. So, but anyway, thank you uh, so much. Well, and um, now, do you have uh, any anything where you want to point the listeners to go to to uh, read some of your papers or, your you know, YouTube? shroud, shroud.com is the shroud.com is the, the best place for it. But easiest way to do it is search alphabetically by last name. And there's a few there that uh, the most recent ones were published in forensics journals. They won't have shroud or anything in the title, uh, but it's about the blood serum and UV, but uh, Barry has them on the website mm. there. So that's kind of the best, uh, the best way to find it, or you could search like Kierce and uh, UV UV three sixty five. That'll take you to the most recent ones there. But they don't, and the paper doesn't really discuss the shroud, the shroud at all. But you can see the implications are there from the like the Vermiller and Pellicori studies mm. that were done as far as the ultraviolet uh, looking at the serum, and also for some of the other characterizations of the blood. A lot of effect on uh, environmental effects on it, heat, etc. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So shroud.com that's uh, run by Barry Schwartz and the, yeah. uh, the Stara and he's great. And I've interviewed him and look for Fantastic. Kearse, K E A R S E K E A R S E. And 
I think it. you said UV365. Is that what you said? UV365. If you want to just do a Google search, Kears UV365, that'll give you like the, I think the last two. Okay, great. Well, again, thank you so much. And then uh, to our listeners, My please pleasure. stay tuned. Uh, please stay tuned for some other video for other videos in this series of the backstory on the Shroud of Turin. Please visit guypowell.com and sign up for more episodes. And if you like this one, please rate it with five stars. Kelly, thank you so much. Thank you, Guy. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.